Good morning, everyone. This is Tom Bautista. I'm the Executive Director of AC Friends of Court. We assist British Columbians in completing legal forms. Uh, these days, we notice uh, when we speak to uh, our clients who call in or send us emails to our online appointment request forms, their sense of stress is quite uh, raised. And you know, given what's happening uh, with the pandemic, we understood this to be sort of the new normal. But we also thought about the idea of hosting a series of interviews with the different chiefs of our courts and the different chairs of tribunals and boards to give the public a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, for, for us to be able to do this, uh, we arranged all these 30 minute clips and uh, we hope you enjoy today's interview. Uh, this series called Dear British Columbians uh, is an opportunity for the viewers to inform the public uh, of the planning and the thinking behind the planning. And I hope our guests uh, will be able to do that as well as tell the public how they are working to even the playing field, given that a fairly significant number of uh, self-represented appellants appeared before your, your appeal uh, board. And finally, to share your reflections on what uh, they're learning and what your officials are learning about what to do given what's happened in the last two months. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our guest today is Daryl Leouye, who uh, has the unenviable task of being the chair of three appeal boards, the Environmental Appeal Board, the Forestry Appeal Board, and the Oil and Gas Appeal Board. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning. Uh, before I ask you uh, my four questions, I wanted to provide you an opportunity to address uh, the public and you can tell them what's going on with the, the three appeal boards. Sure. sure. Yes. Yeah, so uh, just by way of background, uh, the three uh, appeal bodies <laughs> that uh, I serve are all related. They all uh, deal with subject matters concerning natural resource development and the environment in British Columbia. Typically, uh, we receive a wide range of appeals. Uh, things can vary anywhere from uh, decisions concerning landfills or factories being authorized to release certain contaminants into the environment to individuals dealing with uh, various permitting or authorization issues around hunting rights or angling rights. So it runs a wide gamut. Uh, we, I would say the majority of our appellants are self-represented and typically uh, are dealing with a significant disparity in the resources available to them. As you mentioned earlier, uh, there's an interest in leveling the playing ground and, and that's an active issue for us because the respondent is typically the, a decision maker within the province. Uh, no pun intended level the playing ground there. Uh, so um, with that, let me, let me begin uh, to ask you the first question. And I appreciate that two months is somewhat a short time to sort of look at what's happened. But I imagine a lot of changes took place behind the scenes for you to be able to keep the appeal boards running in the last two months. So can you share a little bit with us what lessons you've learned and what you and your um, staff have sort of learned uh, in terms of what needs to happen moving forward when we go beyond the pandemic mode. Absolutely. So for us, the pandemic raised two major concerns. Uh, the first was the threat of uh, disruption of services. Uh, that's significant for us because we primarily operate our pre-hearing processes uh, through exchange of paper. We have some means of uh, doing things electronically, but our, our principal method remains in hard copy. So a disruption to postal services would be significant for us. And uh, the other part of that is uh, a good number of our appeals, once they get to the hearing stage, are resolved through in-person oral hearings that are generally open to the public. So. Uh, as a result of the concerns around the pandemic, we had to uh, adjourn a number of our appeals, including some uh, 
some that had been significantly in progress, you know, five or six weeks into uh, hearings having to suddenly adjourn has been disruptive for the parties involved there. So uh, that, that was the first concern around uh, disruption of services. The other concern, of course, as any uh, business or service delivery entity dealt with was protection of the staff. And those two things uh, coincided for us a little bit because we, as we introduced measures to help protect our staff and insulate them from risks associated with the coronavirus, that exacerbated any difficulties we were going to have with uh, postal delivery, courier delivery, and that sort of thing. So fortunately, uh, as much as those were concerns looking forward, we didn't face any significant barriers with respect to postal service or other deliveries. So the document side of our business continued uh, without significant impact. Where we did suffer a significant impact was of course with the oral hearings, which uh, have been adjourned completely uh, starting in March and continuing to date. Uh, so for me, the lesson that I took from that for the future is that we need to build in more flexibility in our processes. We need to facilitate not only hard copy exchange of documents, but also electronic processes that'll make that uh, a more flexible and dynamic process. We also need to offer other avenues for in-person hearings other than uh, in person. And a good example of that is the technology we're using today. Uh, the sort of things I think everyone is getting familiar with or everyone who has the good fortune to have computer access is getting familiar with and that's um, using video conferencing. So we're actively working right now to develop and reinforce our um, video conferencing hearing capability and to offer more flexibility in the future. So not only can we respond to potential service disruptions or other crises in the future, but also so that we can offer a wider range of services that better meet the needs of the parties that appear before us. Thank you, Daryl. Um, that leads me uh, to my second question because you've alluded to it already. Let's talk technology, shall we? Um, so you're sort of in the process of developing, uh, I guess what we call sort of alternative uh, means to uh, receive and conduct your business from uh, appellants. Uh, can you shed a little bit more light maybe in terms of what you're thinking of in terms of how you see this going to happen? Is there a target timing? Anything yes. like that? Sure. Yes, absolutely. So it, uh, it is an ongoing process. Uh, the government has been working hard to get a reliable and secure video conferencing service available that's ad adaptable to hearing needs. That's come online uh, just in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, where we have something secure where the information is going to be contained uh, within the jurisdiction and uh, you know, so, that, so that we are acting in a way that's consistent with our privacy obligations. Now that we have that in place, uh, it's been a focus of mine to build up those uh, electronic hearing processes, training resources for members who would be expected to run hearings, creating new uh, job roles around moderating those hearings, and preparing resources to assist those who are going to be parties to the appeals so that they can meaningfully participate and not feel overwhelmed uh, going into a hearing day using unfamiliar technology. So setting that up so that it all flows easily and, and everyone's comfortable with the process before it goes underway. So that's what we're looking at from a prospective basis. And I do wanna make sure uh, that we don't sacrifice access to justice in the interests of this, which is potentially a more efficient process from our perspective. We have to uh, remain aware that we're ultimately serving the public. And these electronic hearings are not going to work for everyone. So we want to make sure that we're still maintaining those traditional service avenues that uh, have served us well in the past while building in that flexibility to offer alternative ways for people to 
process their appeals in a way that works for them. Thank you for that. And it's very reassuring because it indeed is an access issue. Uh, a significant portion of our clients um, are not able to use computers. Uh, and in the past, they've relied on public intermediaries like the libraries and community centers to do their business. Those are not open yet. Uh, so a lot of them um, try to phone. And so I wanted to ask you what your phone service is like. Yes, well, we have a phone service throughout the working day. We haven't had any disruption there. And uh, I believe anyone who wants to reach us by telephone is, is able to do that pretty reliably. So phone service is available, email is available. Uh, In-person visits are usually welcome. We just have the one office in Victoria, so that's not an option for most of the province at the best of times, and right now is not an option for anyone. Although we are going to be reopening uh, Monday morning on June 8th, so um, we were, that's, sorry, not opening to the public, but reopening the office itself, and in short order, I expect, we'll be able to open to the public. Um, I do also want to emphasize that uh, there was a ministerial order uh, earlier in the pandemic, which gave chairs of tribunals the flexibility to extend, suspend, or waive deadlines associated with filing appeals. And uh, I've taken advantage of that. Uh, I wanted to make sure that um, this discretion I was given could be exercised particularly in favor of those who need it most. Uh, so rather than um, set a, a definitive time limit on that extension, uh, I've applied it sort of across the board for anyone who has an appeal that they want to advance to the board. And um, the hope there is that people can stay at home, uh, adhere to the recommendations from our health authorities and not feel that they have to rush out to a post office to meet a filing deadline or go and buy envelopes or whatever they need to do to meet these filing deadlines that in ordinary circumstances, uh, at least for the Environmental Appeal Board, uh, we can't extend. So uh, that's one step that we did to make sure that uh, people maintain access, even if right now they have to prioritize their health and well-being or the health and well-being of those that they live with or are close to. So very on point because you are my 10th interviewee but the very first one who I've heard articulate a position where you you basically said there is no hard sort of deadline or date by which you're, you're moving limitation dates and, and deadlines to, and from there the clock begins to tick. So uh, good on you. Uh, I, I think that flexibility, even within the tribunal world, is unheard of, so to speak, because there's still sort of systems to put in place. And uh, given the significant number of self-represented appellants who appear before you, I think that is reassuring. Oh, thank you. So I don't know how long you're going to be able to keep it up, Daryl, but uh, I, I, I hope it works. <laughs> thank you. Yes, me too. And um, now earlier you spoke about uh, the movement towards uh, using uh, technology to allow people to make submissions. You voiced your concern that one of the things that you're making sure happens is that their security and privacy is uh, preserved. Can you talk a little bit about that? What are you doing? Sure. Well, the what I was referring to before is mostly uh, technologically related uh, information security, I suppose I'll say. Just making sure that uh, it's not crossing, the information is not crossing any borders where we have to be concerned about uh, other authorities feeling they can take a look at what is going on in our procedures uh, and what is going on in the particular circumstances of any appeals. Um, more generally, uh, there is a balancing act that we need to do. And it's particularly important for the boards that uh, I work for. And that's, we need to balance the privacy concerns uh, of individuals and 
in the pandemic situation, people's safety concerns with how many people they're interacting with on one hand. And on the other hand, the desirability of having an appeal process that's transparent and that's open and that's accountable. And that's particularly important for my boards because our respondents are either governmental decision makers or decision makers appointed by government. So it's an extension of government decision making. It's a check on government decision making. And so it's particularly important that it's transparent and accountable to the public. So that's why it's very important for us to have processes that are open to the public. But at the same time, we appreciate that there are sensitive matters that are not always appropriate for public consumption. So we're granted the discretion to receive particular pieces of evidence or even to convene hearings that are closed to the public. Uh, what we do there is we rely on the parties to identify that, uh, those concerns, bring them forward so that we can engage in the sort of very fact specific balancing that goes on or see if there's a way that we can address the concern without closing off the appeal altogether from, from public accountability. Um, so that of course means that you need to provide an informed opportunity for the parties to do that and a, a safe environment for them to be able to express those concerns. Uh, since I've taken over as chair last year, I've been working toward um, realigning our processes and refining our procedures. And part of that is uh, an active and early case management system. And part of that, uh, as I continue to move forward through that process, is hopefully going to involve early touch uh, by myself or by a vice chair, so some someone who is of some decision-making authority with the appeal body, so they can help raise those issues so people know that they can advance, know the tests they need to make, and uh, so that we can appropriately balance those privacy concerns with the accountability needs that we have. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I will have follow-up questions, but I will, I will embed them in my next two questions. So, sure. um, Let's talk about uh, trying to even the playing field, or in your case, the ground. Yep. Uh, let's talk about the things that you actively do to make sure that even uh, with self-represented appellants on one side, that they understand what the procedural uh, expectations are, what the rules that they are bound by, uh, because they're doing it alone. Yes, well, thank you. That is, uh, I think, probably one of our more pressing concerns that we're trying to tackle and that we're going to continue to tackle. Um, I may, I may uh, jump around a little bit, but uh, I, I would like to reference the uh, Canadian Judicial Council's statement on principles of self-represented litigants and accused persons. And that was uh, endorsed in the Pentea decision from the Supreme Court of Canada, of course. And uh, I think that statement is uh, a significant one and, and it's one that I would also endorse as good practice. Basically what we need to do, and it is an ongoing process for us, is to ensure that we have clear accessible processes that promote responsive and flexible and timely uh, appeal procedures and decision making. We need to be proactive in providing uh, lay people who are parties before us with information and resources so that they can uh, equip themselves to advance their appeals. We need to receive evidence in a way that's flexible and doesn't uh, unnecessarily hinder self-represented parties. Um, we need to ensure that we have staff that's accessible to answer procedural questions while not giving legal advice or advancing the case for those people. And uh, we need to have as the target, as we redesign and refine our processes, those self-represented parties. We can't have our processes targeted at um, you know, lawyers who have lots of resources and capability. 
and uh, I think it will ultimately benefit everyone, including those who are having to pay those lawyers to have the processes more simple, to have it be less expensive for the parties to have these appeals. So that's it in, in a broad context. If you'd like me to drill down into that, I'm happy to. Let's talk about my favorite topic. Sure. Legal, legal information and legal advice. Yes. What goes through your training? Because if I was, uh, as the public, and your viewers are all looking at you now, <laughs> if I had to reach out uh, to the appeal board, and oftentimes than not, I wouldn't know the difference when I ask a question on what, whether my question is actually seeking legal advice or not. How do you handle these questions? Well, for our staff, they face a particularly difficult challenge as far as that goes. Uh, the Environmental Appeal Board on its own handles appeals from eight different provincial statutes. Forestry Appeals Commission handles five, and the Oil and Gas Appeal Tribunal handles one, the Oil and Gas Activities Act, but it's a pretty significant piece of legislation. There's also a number of regulations that exist under all kinds of different pieces of legislation there. So it's quite a monumental task for our staff to have to be up to date on all those processes. So when they get a substantive question, um, if they're not sure whether it's straying into inappropriate ground, they're always welcome to touch base with um, either legal counsel, myself, or a vice chair uh, at the tribunal. And that's really, uh, having an open door policy that way is really important given the diversity of cases that we have. And it's just not reasonable to exp expect frontline staff to be able to draw that distinction in every case in every situation with every uh, piece of legislation that we touch. So having ready support for them is absolutely important and making that timely support is important for the people who are facing deadlines and, and are looking for information. So uh, generally speaking, uh, the distinction is in is it process related or is it uh, su substantive information about the decision under appeal or the case to be made. So um, I typically will uh, urge caution on the part of staff until they're able to touch base uh, with someone who has a little more familiarity with those questions. And then the other side to that is in these early case management conferences that uh, I'm holding with appeals. Um, I am trying to help at least with issue identification and with identifying the sorts of evidence that people might need to consider to advance their argument, whether they need to consider expert testimony, for example, and explaining from a broad point of view whether uh, they need an expert to provide an opinion or whether it's an opinion a layperson can provide or whether it's not an opinion at all. Uh, again, we don't get into the evidence in those uh, pre-hearing conferences, those case management conferences, but talking about evidence and talking about issues and how they interrelate is, is a key component of what we do in those processes. And even for the uh, respondents, I think that this, as we go through it and do it more and more often and build it into as a core element of our processes, I think the respondents will benefit as well. Yes. Ultimately, uh, they'll be able to face more focused, more relevant uh, arguments and evidence that are put before them that are framed in a way that uh, don't involve as many motions or objections on the other side. And we can really get to the substance of the matter that both parties should want to discuss. So, uh the appellant should look forward to the invitation uh, to appear before our case management conference. Yes, uh, almost almost always right now we're we're building that in, and we are engaged in a in a process refinement project right now. Mm -hmm. We're in consultation phases with that. We've been consulting with the public and other stakeholders because. As much as uh, I like to think that I know best, uh, you know, it's ultimately not me who's using the system. Ultimately, it's the public and the respondents who are using the system. And so we want to make sure that we're not making changes without getting feedback from those groups. 
So uh, things are changing and they're dynamic in, in my boards, but uh, we're moving more toward uh, stronger case management and more active and early case management. Um, it may not be in every case, and that's something we're still feeling out. Do, is that something we need, for example, in some of those uh, hunting or angling issues that are fairly straightforward and, and maybe don't need a lot of evidence? It, the answer might be yes or might be no, but that's a conversation that we're having uh, as we go on. Um, at some point, you will open, however you define, and I put quotes, open. The open yes. sign will be uh, foisted. Who gets heard first because you've suspended operations? Who gets heard first? Who is, is there going to be sort of a, a way you're going to determine rankings of what is urgent and non-urgent? Because I presumably think that for a self-rep, their case is urgent, but you can't hear all of them all at once. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. So when it comes to urgency, uh, I would say there are very few cases where uh, you'll get across the board agreement that it's urgent. And those uh, get some priority if there's really a, a time sensitive element to it and there is sort of this universally agreed urgency. But I wanna be careful to avoid imposing my concept of urgency on our appeals generally. Um, in the context of someone who's hunting, for example, there's some urgency there because the decision has to be returned in within the same hunting season, for example, in some cases. Or there may be a cultural element to hunting for some of our uh, appellants. And uh, there may be time sensitive elements even within a hunting season for some of these uh, cultural aspects to the activity. So those may not be apparent to me, but that's why I don't wanna necessarily impose uh, my understanding or my assumptions on what is urgent on those uh, various appeals. On the other side, you may have someone doing property development that's stalled and uh, the financing uh, of a delayed project might well be urgent for that party. So uh, again, I, I like to treat all of our cases as uh, urgent in a way. We rely on our parties to marshal evidence and to uh, compose their arguments and present them. And so we can kind of keep a lot of balls in the air because if we're helping them do that and equipping them in a way that they can do that through these case management conferences, uh, then we can rely on them to be doing a lot of the work up until it comes time for the hearing. Now I'm fortunate because I have a relatively large uh, contingent of part-time members, the per diem members. So as we uh, deal with these hearings coming around, uh, I have some flexibility and I can uh, at the same time uh, distribute appeals to a, quite a number of decision makers. So I have some built-in capacity to do that. Um, and then the, the last element of that, of course, is uh, some matters. At some point, there, is, there may be a choke point in terms of too many matters to, to get decisions finalized by through our staff, for example. And in that case, we look at uh, really time sensitive matters. If things are related to uh, orders that are set on particular time frames where there's no stays associated with the appeals, mm -hmm. those are things that might have to come first. But uh, really the, the getting from a decision that's completed by our members to the decision actually being published is fairly short time frame. So I'm hopeful, crossing fingers, that uh, we're not gonna see any significant delays and that we don't have to do any sort of major triage process that, that's gonna impact those using our systems. I, I want to acknowledge uh, the sensitivity you've expressed towards our indigenous neighbors uh, when you make specific references to their requests because of uh, cultural and uh, just livelihood issues, which I imagine must occupy the appeal boards fairly often. Uh, so thank you for that. Oh, you're, yes, you're, you're welcome. Absolutely. It's, uh, I think it's important for, I mean, particularly for my boards, given the nature of our work. Yes. But uh, I think that's uh, important for all 
uh, administrative law bodies to, to keep in mind those with traditional issues surrounding access to justice and um, for whom these decisions are particularly significant. Thank you for that. And I, I'm sure our indigenous neighbors who will be viewing this uh, will be happy to hear that you have them in mind. Um, that leads to my last question because you've sort of touched on it already. Uh, the other side, the respondents are more often than not um, uh, represented by council. And you said earlier, you uh, your role is to provide sort of the check. Uh, still, um, they have interest board, uh, interest bodies like uh, lawyer associations and whatnot. So there's a fair bit of uh, consultations that can uh, take place because um, the bar is sort of specialized in that way. And it's easy for them to reach out. Whereas the average person doesn't have that uh, leverage uh, to sort of make their views known. Now, a few minutes ago, you said to us, uh, you don't presume to know everything and you like to ask people what's going on. If I had something to say to you, how do I do this? Do I reach out to you uh, in a certain way that you like? Yes, well, uh, everyone who has an appeal uh, in our boards uh, has access to our, our registrar or to um, frontline staff and they have a direct line to me. We're a fairly small office. So uh, I encourage anyone who has these issues to use those open lines of communication and uh, I, I'll do my best uh, through handling these, pr uh, the pre-hearing matters to uh, listen to the concerns and treat them with the appropriate degree of sensitivity and balance those concerns when I need to. And so that communication within the bounds of an appeal is a very important element of having people feel connected to the process and connected to the decision that, that ultimately comes out of it. Uh, it's a concern that I have heard throughout my administrative law career that people sometimes come out of their appeals and they feel that things took a left turn on them and that um, they didn't get the chance to present their cases they'd like to or they didn't get a chance to argue it as they like to. They felt it got away from them. Uh, the highest mark that uh, I can give to uh, an administrative de law decision maker from my days as a representative was when an appellant came out and said, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to win or lose, but I feel like I was heard. And that's a standard that I always try and meet and that I encourage the members of my boards to meet. So maintaining that open communication throughout hearing what their concerns are from the outset and trying to adjust pre-hearing processes uh, to be responsive to those are an important element. But in the hearing itself, it's also important that they get to advance their case and that they get a decision that ultimately is responsive to that and doesn't go down uh, any side path as much as that's possible. You know, sometimes there can be legalistic concerns that need to be addressed, but ultimately, the concerns raised by the parties should be uh, should get a substantive amount of time in the actual decision. And to me, that's a hallmark of good decision writing. And then outside of that, uh, we are engaging in research. We've done a survey of historical system users this year, uh, which is the first time we've done it in our history. Uh, I've also done some outreach with various citizen groups, including our Indigenous neighbors. Uh, to hear their perspectives uh, in a more long-form process. So it's not as uh, quantitative as a survey, but you know, to hear some lived experience. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for ways that I can maintain that open communication outside of the context of an appeal as well. So that we know if the reforms that we're trying to do are working and are working for the public that we're serving, or if we need to keep adjusting and improving as we go, and I expect that will be the case, uh, that we aren't gonna get it all perfect in one shot. Um, but uh, it's a process uh, to juggle that with the uh, constraints we have on resources, but I'm, I'm actively looking for ways to maintain those contacts uh, 
so that we can continue to improve and uh, serve the public better. Thank you, Daryl. I know our conversation, I wasn't planning on talking about, um, about our, the work that you do uh, to take care of our indigenous neighbors, uh, but there, we had it, so that's good. <laughs> I, <laughs> and thank you for indulging me, by the way. Uh, oh, my pleasure. So I've run out of questions, but I wanted to give you the privilege of uh, some final remarks that you can, uh, you want to share with our viewers? Wonderful, okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to address your viewers and to address the public. To me, it's uh, important that the public feels that they can engage with the administered law community. And that can be a challenge at times. We know access can be a, a challenge, but. Ultimately, we're here to serve the public and we're here to be stewards of the legal process and make that simpler and more accessible for people. That should be the overarching goal that we have. So uh, I'm, I'm doing my best to engage and to refine our processes to make them more accessible. And uh, I I'd encourage people to reach out if they have experience with our boards. Um, and uh, we have an email address of engagement at gov.bc.ca, which comes uh, to my boards and, and uh, help us uh, improve and, and uh, start a conversation. Well, on that note, I wanted to thank you. I also, on behalf of uh, the public, wanted to convey our appreciation for the work that you're doing and your colleagues, and we wish you all um, to stay well and as you get ready to open in quotes on Monday. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for your time, Daryl, and take care. Thank you. All right, goodbye.